Hi everyone, in this video lecture I would like to provide a brief overview of overall good instruction in literacy for the middle grades. So in part one, let's talk about differing models of reading and this will include a discussion of the reading wars. Too often when we see the term reading wars, if we've heard the debates going on, we think that that's limited to the early grades, first grade, second grade, and we think that it's only about phonics, and that's definitely not the case. So we've really got a division between two different overarching umbrellas. Now, when I use the term bottom up and top down, I'm not talking about actual names of actual models if you were to study um, theoretical models and frameworks for understanding reading. There is no model that is specifically called the bottom-up model, and there is no model that is specifically called the top-down model. Um, I'm using broad umbrella terms under which other uh, more sophisticated models uh, can fit. For instance, the term bottom-up, which is what I'll talk about first, uh, deals with reading words from part to whole. You start with uh, the, the smallest sound parts uh, and then connecting sounds to written language and a sound to, uh, and then you go on up from smallest of this other part of the word to whole, and then eventually up to whole sentences. That's what I mean by a bottom up. Um, reading is thought of as a very step by step serial process. Um, this is typical for what you find in the simple view of reading, for instance. By contrast, the top down model uh, is where oftentimes children will start with the big picture of language, um, understanding whole words and understanding the love of just the overall view of language. And then once we get to the big picture and children start to fall in love with uh, sight words, for instance, or the sound of a poem or the sound of music and uh, fit to certain lyrics, now we help children to break from whole to part and eventually uh, children learn decoding and phonics and so forth uh, from a whole to part standpoint. Two very different ways of viewing it. Uh, top down is more typical for what we find an approach called whole language. Um, now these views, simple view of reading versus whole language, um, have been really at odds with each other for a long time. And even before we had um, terms such as simple view of reading and whole language in use, um, the whole language movement really started in the 70s and 80s. Uh, it's, it especially took life in the, in the 80s, uh, for instance, and the simple view of reading is a model of reading that really dates to a landmark 1986 uh, publication by Gowan Tumner. But so even before we had that, we used to have debates in the mid uh, 1950s and even before that in the early 1900s and even before that even the 1800s we had and before that in the 1700s for that matter we had debates uh, between whether to um, learn language from whole to part or lang learn language from part to whole it's not a new debate and it has been contentious for a very long time. So in the bottom-up model, reading is viewed as basically a matter of decoding um, a series of written symbols, and then we work from these written symbols on up to the big picture. Um, in the bottom-up model, the first task is basically learning the alphabetic principle, otherwise called concepts of print and so forth. And then eventually children work on up, up from concepts of print uh, to various levels of phonemic awareness and phonological awareness. You'll learn more about those terms as we, see, as we move further in this course. Um, that phonemic awareness and phonological awareness basically deal with um, understanding the sound principle of language, understanding that sounds have meaning. Um, and then eventually we get into phonics. And phonics deals with letter sound correspondence. Um, and eventually they work on its way up. And it's very carefully step by step, step by step from part to whole in the bottom up model. And like I said, it's thought of as a serial process. I'd like to encourage you to see this link from. Um, of uh, this link from Murray Murray on the simple view of reading. 
So in the simple view of reading, I'm just going to go briefly into it in this, and then later in this course, I'll, go, I'll give you a more broader overview of the simple view of reading. But it's basically decoding uh, times language comprehension equals reading comprehension. It's basically a mathematical form of the way you look at it. So decoding, you're looking at understanding the letter sound correspondence in words and how to make sense out of that. Language comprehension, you're dealing with how to, um, how to make sense out of what you listen in language and the various components of language. And then if these two things make sense, you can comprehend a text simple view of reading. Uh, Scarborough's Reading Rope, which is at this point pretty famous, um, and it's being used by teachers within their classrooms pretty widely, especially as we get into a movement called the science of reading. Um, and I've got some articles for you to read a lot that will help you understand that term. I'll talk more about that term later in this video. Uh, and under Scarborough's Reading Rope, it's a very nice visual representation of the simple view of reading. Uh, the bottom end of the rope uh, deals with the, coding, with the decoding aspect of the simple view of reading. You've got your awareness of sound parts, otherwise known as phonological awareness, your awareness of letter sound correspondence, how to make sense out of letters or count sound correspondence, both in reading, which deals with decoding, and in writing, which deals with spelling. Um, and you've got your sight recognition. And then the top part of the part of the rope is what we mean by the reading comprehension aspect of the simple view of reading. That includes background knowledge, vocabulary knowledge, the structure of how language works, and your verbal reasoning um, as a reader, and, and, and there's also a simple view of writing that we'll get into in a separate video that I've included for you, um, which works in a very similar way. Um, and of course, your overall knowledge of the processes of reading. If you are increasingly automatic in word recognition, the decoding aspects, um, so that you so that this, this becomes something that you do without even thinking about it, that helps you towards skilled reading. Um, and all of these strands of word recognition should, should work together. And ideally, you become increasingly strategic in your use of these language comprehension strands so that eventually they tie together, they work together. And as these things become linked, as with increasingly both strategic and and use of language comprehension and automaticity in the word recognition aspect, um, you become a more fluent reader and you become better able to comprehend text. Um, so if you understand the Scarborough's rope, you understand uh, the simple view of reading very well. Um, and all of this has clear implications for a teacher, right? You um, start by making sure the students understand the word recognition, give explicit instruction there, and then as a middle school teacher, hopefully your students will, will have achieved automaticity in the word recognition components, and so therefore you can focus on explicitly instructing them and guiding through them through increasingly strategic use of uh, vocabulary and background knowledge and so forth. Now there are some critiques of the bottom-up view. Um, for instance, it's a very linear um, model of reading and some uh, would argue that reading is not necessarily a linear process always. Um, that uh, making sense of language and making sense of reading and writing is more messy than that. Um, and more complex. Complex might be a more um, researchy word to use, but you know what I mean. Um, and sometimes one, another critique is that um, the role of the reader and the role and the role of the reader in context with their surroundings and influences in in the broader culture um, is sometimes underestimated. And things like motivation can be um, not well enough taken into account under some under some critiques. Next, we go to top down, and um, if you want to look more into the top down model, look up uh, works by, for instance, Kenneth Goodman and Yetta Goodman associated with whole language. Uh, th those would be good examples of top down. If you want to look more into bottom up, look more into works by, for instance, David Kilpatrick. And overall, books being promoted uh, by the science of reading movement. Um, in places like the Reading League. And frankly, the state of Arkansas is 
widely promoting these approaches associated with, for instance, Orton Gillingham. Um, now, when I use the term science of reading, I'm not in this way. Um, I'm not referring to everything that can be included in an overall science of reading. What I'm talking about is a movement that um, has grown up since about 2017, 2018, that promotes a bottom-up view of reading. Um, largely, it's, it's largely associated with things like the simple view of reading, four-part processor that we'll look into. It uh, very much uh, is backed by um, a great deal of research that is in the National Reading Panel report. Um, and it promotes very explicit systematic instruction of reading and literacy skills. And now to be clear, some critics of the science of reading movement would characterize it as mostly about phonics. And it's not just about phonics. And in fact, as future middle school teachers, or for that matter, high school teachers, the simple view of uh, the science of reading movement and the simple view of reading has a lot to say for middle school teachers and high school teachers, and I hope that you'll see that as we go on with this with this lesson. It's absolutely not just about phonics, and it's absolutely not just about um, early literacy. So. Uh, with a top-down approach, which is most clearly exemplified by whole language. Um, the the top-down approach emphasizes encouraging readers to make meaning of an overall selection, often in conversation, and often in dialogue, and then you work your way down toward understanding um, cues and unrecognized words and grammar part and how to decode and phonics and all that stuff. Um, so the reading for meaning is the primary objective uh, rather than mastery of letters and letter sound relationships and words. That doesn't mean you skip over mastery of letter and, and letter sound relationships, but you learn that in context of, act, of also making meaning of the text. Often um, a top-down approach is associated with something called three queuing system. Um, you'll learn more about that when I teach more about phonics and phonics debates, uh, but I'm not going to go into three queuing in this pr particular presentation. Uh, the top down, like I said, is widely associated with whole language, as well as transactional view of reading with uh, Louise Rosenblatt. So um, a widespread critique of the top-down model is that um, it fails to adequately address key basic skills such as phonemic awareness and phonics in an explicit and systematic manner. Um, and also when it comes to the three queuing system, uh, some critiques are um, lack of adequate um, empirical quantitative data. Uh, to support the, th the three cueing system, de dealing with um, looking for cues as you make sense out of text from uh, what what does the text look like and what are some context cues and what are some visual cues we can look at and what does a word sound like if you're trying to make sense out of a word, right? And what, is it, uh, what does it look like? What does it sound like? What uh, Does it make sense in context, right? Those are little hints that you would give students under the three queuing system. And one of the, one of the critiques of the three queuing system is that um, we might be in um, people who use the top-down model um, and the three queuing might be encouraging readers to take attention away from focusing on the text and taking guesses based upon pictures. That's, a, that's one of the critiques of top-down models. So I don't want you to come away thinking that it's that you have to choose sides between top down and, and bottom up and it's only one way or the other and there's nothing in the between there's no middle ground right there are there there are definitely middle grounds um and there are definitely a uh, lots of researchers and teachers that draw on both top down and bottom up processes interactively uh, for instance david pearson and um, other scholars that I could uh, start naming, uh, Rommel Hart and Stanovich and so forth, um, advocate that 
uh, the, that readers use both top-down and bottom-up processes. Um, now at times, depending on context of the reading um, and depending on developmental level of the child and so forth, at times a child might focus more on top-down approaches and at times, uh, meaning the decoding, for instance, and the, um, the parts of words. And at times, uh, children might focus more on the top down rather than bottom up. Um, and oftentimes, these are interactively used so that they inform each other. Uh, what this means as a teacher is that uh, if you are into the interactive models that's promoted by, for instance, David Pearson, and I want you to, I'd really encourage you to click this link that I've included with you for uh, David Pearson talking about this. If you are into an interactive model, that means identifying based upon context whether a bottom-up approach is advocated by science of reading movement and, for instance, Kilpatrick and Louisa Motes. Um, you'll find examples of bottom-up um, and Louise Spears swirling, uh, for instance. Uh, so if you, and you, lots of examples on the Reading League, um, readingleague.com, um, if you, or readingleague.org rather, um, you'll find lots of bottom-up resources. Um, so if you're into an interactive approach, there will be times when those approaches are absolutely appropriate and most appropriate, but in interactive models, there are also times when sometimes a top-down whole word, whole um, whole text approach, um, focusing on meaning is more appropriate. Um, and you have to be able to identify based upon assessment and observation of the child, formal as well as informal assessment of the child, in other words. So you have to be able to identify which is more appropriate at this particular time and recognize that they, that um, draw on each interactively so they both inform each other to improve education. Now some models that are associated with interactive views and, and, and again there um, these are the interactive view that's an overall broad umbrella under which these things fall would be cognitive views of reading, socio-cognitive views of reading. By cognitive I mean drawing on for instance a great deal about cognitive science and information processing models. Um, Socio-cognitive, which means the so social plus cognitive combined. Um, Socio-cognitive deals with overall, so how does society work, how do cultures work, and how does that inform reading? And then you've got new literacies and digital literacies, which deals with differences that we encounter um, when we switch back and forth between reading a text that is on print or communicating in a text that's on print versus communicating with a text that is digital. Uh, because there, when you think about different type of text we're talking about, paper versus uh, computer screen, for instance, and we're talking about um, hyperlinks and so many ways in which it can uh, in which digital text work differently than print text. The argument under digital literacy is that uh, the very nature of reading and understanding the reading processes has to be understood as changed, as different, um, as we get into this digital age. And um, those people like um, David Ranking and Donald Liu, uh, for instance, who follow under the digital literacy camp, um, would advocate that um, would advocate that we ought to be taking more of an interactive view of reading. So in part two, let's deal with the four-part processor. The four-part processor is absolutely vital for you to understand as a middle grades teacher or high school teacher, not just elementary teacher, uh, because I guarantee you, your principal, if you, especially if you teach English or reading, um, your principal is very likely going to want you to understand this and is going to want you to be able to know implications for instruction from this. Uh, and um, I realize that right now in the state of Arkansas, only special education as well as elementary students are required to pass the Pearson Foundations of Reading Test. But fair warning, it wouldn't surprise me if um, middle school uh, teachers are increasingly held to science of reading um, expectations by the state of Arkansas and other states over time. Um, and four-part processor is definitely being promoted by the science of reading movement. Uh, in fact, 
one of the co-authors of the leading paper uh, that support with research that promotes a four-part processor named Mark Seidenberg, a neuroscientist, um, is also one of the leading figures in the science of reading movement. Uh, and if you want to know more about that movement, look at articles that I've attached for you to read um, on Blackboard. So uh, the four parts of the, of the model would be phonological processing, which deals with understanding the sound of language and the sound parts of language and understanding that these sound parts have meaning and how to make sense out of it. You've got your meaning making system. How do you comprehend? You've got your context processing system, which deals with um, how do you make sense in context? And how do you take context into account? And then the orthographic processing system deals with writing and spelling. So here's a model of the four-part processor. Notice that each of these areas are linked. Um, the context processing deals with experience and la overall language use. It's, it runs bi-directionally with the meaning processor. Meaning processor deals with comprehension as well as use of vocabulary. Um, the phonological processor deals with speech sounds uh, as they're made, understanding speech sounds and understanding that there's a purpose behind why speeches come out. It's all about sound. And then you've got your orthographic processor, uh, which deals with letters and spelling and writing. Notice that with phonics, um, one implication that you ought to be able to see here is that too often we think of phonics as something that is all about reading. And decoding right uh, but one implication here is the bi-directional link between phonics and writing which should tell you that as you teach your even middle grade students to become more skillful and purposeful writers that's also going to help them become more pur 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 more purposeful and skillful as readers um, including the decoding and phonics aspects, that's letter sound correspondence, and including the meaning. Notice that making sense, comprehension in reading, including vocabulary, is bidirectional with skilled writing. So the phonological processing system, most of your students in middle grades should have have this down pat by the time they get to you. Um, deals with listening for and producing speech sounds, um, gathering meaning from spoken language, and activating the meaning processing system. So we go from making sense out of sounds and recognizing these sounds toward careful listening and then making meaning out of it. The meaning processing system is where uh, you retrieve stored information uh, that's collected in your, in your memory using a schema. Um, you collect and store meaning to be retrieved later, and it activates the context processing system. From there, the context processing system is where we put words into context, meaning in context, meaning background knowledge, right? And our experiences with families and broader culture. The orthographic processing system deals with processing of print into meaning, um, examination of word features and language structures, matching sounds to spelling, and um, repetition and practice helps your students gain skill um, in writing and using language structures in the use of writing and in the use of spelling. Next, let's quickly look, because I'm, I'm going through these concepts fairly brief. I'm not spending an enormous amount of time, but hopefully it's helping you. Um, next, let's take a look at the connection between reading and writing, which is so crucial to you. Because hopefully what you get out of understanding the four-part processor bottom line is the importance of listening and speaking for students and including listening and speaking activities for your students. The importance of students making sense out of background knowledge and connecting background knowledge and contextual experiences uh, to what they read and write. The ways in which reading and writing are absolutely inter interlinked and the way that writing activities with students, including spelling, can help students build phonic skills and build their reading skills and vice versa, um, which means include writing instruction in with reading instruction and include reading activities in with writing um, so that st students 
are building their skills in both. So, um, readers uh, draw very actively on knowledge while reading, uh, and they also draw very, uh, very actively on the knowledge of writing when they read. So their skill in reading and their skill in writing informs one to another very interactively. Knowledge of features of the text, such as decoding, um, will help students to also encode. What I mean by that is that a student who is skillful in phonics and the purposeful use of the phonics rules is more likely to be a skilled speller um, and vice versa. As students gain more knowledge purposefully in spelling rules and why words are spelled a certain way rather than just memorizing them, uh, then that skill will also help that student become a more purposeful decoder of words using phonics. And also, as you think about strategies of why you write a certain way, why you write with a certain purpose, why you use certain writing strategies and um, so forth, uh, that's also going to help a child and be more anticipatory and purposeful and strategic in their reading. So strong writing instruction is very explicit. Um, in terms of the mechanics of writing, including spelling, um, how to write with active verbs, how to choose certain words, how to choose certain vocabulary in certain contexts, how to have a, you know, the uh, how to write with clear voice and how to write with clear descriptions. It's you're very explicit. You're very direct. You you teach these uh, these skills very directly to students. You also guide students through um, this with time for practice. Use mentor texts. A mentor text would be, uh, let's say, for instance, that children are working with um, with an activity in which they want to use vivid imagery, right? Um, if, if you want students to use vivid imagery, then you use text for them to read as models that also use vivid imagery. That's called a mentor text. And you often want to have conferences with students to, to have feedback and dialogue and understand what their thought processes is, are and share with them how they can keep growing and make a joint plan together. Uh, the teacher wants you want to very actively model the writing processes with your students. That so and and that includes share your writing, uh, share think alouds with your students. Have children engage in active conversation, active inquiry on diverse projects. And oftentimes you want to have opportunities for students to enjoy sharing their writing with one another and with the whole class. Next, let's briefly deal with basic overview of phonics. There's, this could be potentially a big discussion. I'm just going to keep it relatively brief for now. So, a phonics deals with knowing relationships between sounds and letters and, and what the rules are that um, guide us toward making um, sense between sounds, the way that sounds operate in language, and the way that letters operate in language. Um, you want it, uh, what the state really wants you to do, um, and this is based upon largely um, the bottom-up approach now. You want to use what's called structured literacy. For more on structured literacy, structured literacy is widely promoted by the International Dyslexia Association. If you want to go to uh, the website, it's ida.org, um, or just Google International Dyslexia Association, you can find a great deal of resources on structured literacy from the International Dyslexia Association. You can also find a great deal of resources on structured literacy from the Reading League. Um, Louisa Motes and um, Spear Swirling are uh, largely known for their writings on structured literacy also if you want to look that up and I can send you resources um, in addition. If you ever want resources beyond what I'm giving to the class, write to me. I've got to have my fingertips. Uh, so structured literacy deals with intentional instruction of letter sound combination. It's not something that you do by chance and not something that, okay, let's focus on the meaning and let's focus on enjoying the text. Now we 
hypothetically stumbled on something. Now let's deal with the letter sound correspondence. It's not like that. It's very strategic. It's very much planned out. And it's sequenced from easier tasks on up to harder tasks. So the approach that is very strongly recommended by DESI, therefore by likely your principal, um, is called synthetic phonics. Now there are various uh, approaches to phonics available out there. Synthetic phonics is widely associated with both the interactive approaches to reading, the interactive models that I was just talking about, as well as the bottom-up models. Um, people who promote bottom-up models, such as Simple View of Reading, the Science of Reading movement that I was talking about, such as International Dyslexia Association, um, will uh, very much promote synthetic phonics. Um, there, are, there are other approaches. Um, and I'm not going to deal with that for this purpose because in this introduction, this overall overview, I want to focus especially on what I know <laughs> that DESI wants you to know. Uh, so uh, synthetic phonics involves very systematically sounding out words, which means you as a teacher have a systematic lesson plan, um, especially if you're teaching English language arts and reading. Um, in which your your lesson plan calls for work on phonics, uh, then you would need, need to have a lesson plan in which you are very explicitly and step by step. When I say systematic, what I really mean is you lay out step one, I do this, step two, I do this, step three, I do this, and here's how I'm, and here's my explicit learning goal, and here's how I'm going to assess for that learning goal. That's what I mean by systematic. Um, and so as students are ready, you teach very well structured lesson, meaning your steps, your scope and sequence. In other words, your scope means how deep and wide do you go in your lesson. Sequence means when do you teach things. Uh, step one, you do this. Step two, you do that. That's what I mean by sequence. You've got a very clear scope and sequence to your lessons as you teach uh, students to make sense out of sound parts um, to create words, for instance, and to blend sounds into spoken words and to work with sounds such as p, h, f, own, for instance, to make phone and more complicated rules of phonics as well that often we get into with polysyllabic words. Next, let's deal with interventions that we can do when children struggle. Uh, so Instruction at your um, individual classroom level as a generalist teacher should involve explicit practice, whether it's in decoding or, for instance, if, if children are struggling in phonics or if they're ch struggling in comprehension, it should be very explicit, very systematic um, in your instruction. In other words, a very clear scope and sequence. Um, you choose uh, text sets that are appropriate for the child. Um, and you teach students how to make sense out of what they're doing, including how to make sense out of the meaning making very purposefully, um, not by chance, in other words. Um, and oftentimes you work hand in hand with a reading specialist and you model the reading strategies through think alouds, for instance. Um, here's how I'm thinking now and here's how I made sense out of it because after all you are the most strategic reader in the class and so you want to help children understand how you go about using certain strategies that you want them to learn how to use. Um, there is what's called multi-tiered systems of support in most schools that you're likely to work in. That means um, most students that are not struggling and would uh, go into tier one, tier one being general education. Uh, when a student starts uh, is identified as struggling sufficiently, then they might get tier two support. Tier two support uh, deals with um, you know, group interventions oftentimes with uh, with guidance by the reading specialist. And then tier three interventions of tier two isn't sufficiently helping. Tier three interventions uh, deal with one-on-one um, -on -one and more intensive intervention by a specialist or specialists, uh, depending on what the specific need is. And what I was just describing is part of the basic model for a response to intervention. 
So interventions deal with, we have to diagnose where the obstacles are to reading. Why is a child struggling? It's not enough to say that a child is struggling. We have to identify why. And oftentimes that's done with very specific diagnosis by a reading specialist. You as a generalist might lack the training to identify uh, the specific reason for why a child is struggling um, if it is, let's say, a disability. Uh, so um, you it should sound obvious, but too often we fail at this, that the intervention needs to very strategically address the specific weakness, um, not the wrong one. Uh, and that sounds obvious, but too often we fail at that. For instance, too many children who are second language learners get misidentified as having a language disability or a reading disability when in fact they're just simply struggling to pick up the second language. It's not a learning disability. Too often times we have inappropriate um, identifications. So um, you've got different reasons for why a child might be struggling. Um, sometimes a child might struggle with language comprehension. Remember that upper strand of the reading rope with, um, with uh, the Scarborough's reading rope. Um, if a child um, is struggling with that upper strand, the language comprehension strand of the reading rope, but they are doing fine when it comes to the decoding or the lower strand of the reading rope, then they would have a language comprehension difficulty. At the extreme end of language comprehension difficulties, if a child is also okay with decoding, you've got students who are hyperlexic. Um, dyslexia deals with um, really, really, really struggling with decoding, um, but you're appropriate when it comes to overall language comprehension. So you've got an extreme deficit um, in the lower end of the reading rope um, if for decoding with, high, with dyslexia, but you're doing okay overall when it comes to language comprehension. Um, but be very careful because dyslexia um, should be diagnosed by a specialist in dyslexia. It's not up to generalists um, at the general education level without uh, the adequate training uh, to uh, diagnose whether a child has dyslexia. But it is appropriate to look for certain signals such as if you see a child who is in your middle school classroom who appears to be okay when it comes to the upper strands of that reading rope with Scarborough's reading rope, but despite all kinds of help and intervention, uh, for instance, despite tier two intervention, they're still continuing to struggle with decoding. Um, then at that time, the IEP team might want to convene and uh, consider the possibility of a examination for possible dyslexia. So dyslexic students, as I was just saying, they're okay in comprehension, but they really have severe decoding difficulties. Um, oftentimes that's also associated uh, with um, struggling to read printed words accurately and rapidly. Oftentimes that's also associated with spelling difficulties. These are signs of it, but not everyone who has a spelling difficulty is dyslexic. Um, in across the United States, there's increasing dyslexia legislation being written to promote uh, to promote the, uh, that states and district schools and local schools are adequately meeting the needs of children with dyslexia. This link that I have here will help you see the pattern of these uh, laws. This link gets um, gets regularly updated. So. Um, the basic definition as defined by International Dyslexia Association of Dyslexia is as follows. It's neurobiological in origins, meaning it is biological, right? Um, it's grounded in uh, phonological processing. Um, in other words, children with dyslexia um, use sounds to process language, uh, and they struggle with making sense of these sounds to, uh, to process language. The core grounding of it is associated with a phonological process 
processing weakness, weakness in the use of sounds to process language. Primary characteristics um, often are shown in difficulty in decoding, in other words, phonics, uh, difficulty with word recognition, and difficulty in spelling. Um, students identified with dyslexia often um, will receive inadequate intervention. Uh, but the appropriate intervention would include phonological phonics as well as work with the word level skills. Next, let's talk about fluency. And if you guys, as I make this, once I get to about the 40 minute part of one of these videos, I, I imagine you guys occasionally taking breaks, pausing the video, that sort of thing. And again, um, I all I definitely, definitely I think that there is an advantage to you guys having a video available, being able to uh, look for which, uh, which minute has which part when you want to focus on something. There might be times when you want to review what dyslexia is. Well, now you've got it and you can always come back to that part of the video. Um, there, uh, for instance, so fluency deals with appropriate pace, appropriate automaticity in reading and appropriate expressiveness. And think of a fluency as basically a bridge between phonics and comprehension. Um, similar to what I said to you with phonics, fluency is not the same thing as comprehension, uh, but it is a strong predictor of comprehension. Uh, in other words, a child who is reading fluently can be more likely predicted to understand the, the text. Um, but at the same time, you want to still double check. You want to still have a dialogue with that student uh, to check for understanding because it's also possible to be a fluent reader and yet not comprehend the text very well. Um, and students who are struggling with, with fluency um, they're pausing it at inappropriate times. Uh, they lack appropriate expressiveness. Uh, for instance, uh, disfluent readers um, can be predicted to uh, very likely struggle with comprehension. Um, think of it in terms of, for instance, uh, our we only have a limited amount of information that we can process in our short term memory. If you're having to focus so much on fluency, on understanding what is the right expressiveness, understanding word parts, understanding um, how the phonics rules work, right? If you're having to focus on that, then you don't have enough attention left to focus on comprehension. Um, and so that's one reason why lack of fluency is a strong predictor of lack of comprehension. Um, and what you want to get to is you want to get to the point where a fluency is something automatic. S students don't even have to think about expressiveness and they don't even have to think about appropriate pace and all that stuff. They can just turn their focus to comprehension of the text. That's what you really want to get to. Just keep in mind, working memory is limited. So you want to make as much as possible of these basic things automatic for students. Um, at the same time, there are times when a student might read disfluency, disfluently with lack of fluency, and yet that student still might comprehend the text. So there are all kinds of activities you can do with children to build up their fluency. Uh, for instance, you can have students read and help them read appropriately with appropriate guidance. You can have children engage in repeated readings of text, again, with guidance. Um, you can have children read with each other. You can do things like reader's theater where they actually practice reading the text and then do performances of a poem or song lyrics or whatever. All these are types of activities that build fluency. Practice in reading, um, it's especially when it is both um, the traditional form of reading as well as um, performative reading where you're reading out loud. Um, practice reading, especially when you're practicing reading the right way with appropriate strategies and appropriate appropriate comprehension strategies and appropriate uh, strategies and making sense out of phonics rules and so forth. Um, 
practice with reading when it's appropriate types of practice um, really, really build a child's fluent, uh, fluency. It's pretty hard to build fluency if you're not having time to practice reading. So next, let's deal with vocabulary and comprehension. One thing I want you to know is uh, that there's a difference between skills that are constrained and skills that are unconstrained um, here. And here's what I mean by that. Once a child masters, for instance, phonics or decoding, um, there's they're not going their 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 gains on a test are going to plateau because you're not going to continue to show gains 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 once you meet mastery at decoding, uh, for instance, or tests of fluency, but you are going to gain in vocabulary your entire life. So let's take, for instance, your uh, middle school students. If a middle school student has mastered the basics of decoding and phonics, they're not going to show rapid gains and high gains, learning gains in phonics if you're continuing to focus on phonics. But they can show um, significant gains in vocabulary if you're, if, you're, um, if you're helping children learn vocabulary. Um, now, comprehension is not so much viewed as a skill. It's more of something that you do that, that builds on all four of these other areas. By these four, I mean, phon I mean phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency and vocabulary. If you understand how to put these things together um, with, uh, with a, uh, in an appropriate way, skillful way, that leads you toward comprehension. So uh, when we talk about vocabulary, there are generally four types of vocabulary, reading, writing, listening, and speaking. Um, and for those of you that have ever learned a second language, um, you should know or even tried to learn a second language. You probably have experience that um, it's easier to pick up um, listening and speaking, and the, the reading writing tends to come much slower. Same thing with your middle school students. So what that shows you is you want to work on all four of these things as you're teaching vocabulary, work on them purposefully, and, you, and work on them interactively, because the listening and the speaking can help a child build the reading and the writing. Um, so basically, vocabulary um, is uh, understanding word parts, learning words by context, learning definitions. But don't uh, I really want you to avoid teaching vocabulary disconnected from the overall text and disconnected from context with word lists and all that stuff. Um, help children learn words in context of situational use and have children apply these words in meaningful, purposeful ways um, in your lessons, whether it is through performing a play, dialogue, writing with a purpose, that sort of thing. Um, and again, test students for their knowledge of vocabulary in different ways, in different contexts, um, and not just these fill-in-the-blank uh, vocabulary tests that too often are used, but can a child make sense out of vocabulary words in various contexts of reading um, and for various purposes? That's when you know a child has mastery, especially if they can, if it's a word that can have multiple meanings, potentially depending on context, um, make sure that, that child is able to differentiate. So when we look at vocabulary as well as comprehension, comprehension deals with making meaning out of text. Again, with structured literacy, you teach these things very explicitly, very directly with guidance and practice. Uh, you help the child um, gain and make use of things like background knowledge and you uh, provide plenty of modeling and your instruction will be sequential with a clear scope and a clear sequence. So you want to use, uh, for instance, different approaches uh, to uh, reading different uh, digital text, different artistic work. Uh, in other words, the various forms of, of, of language use, right? Visual, um, speaking, listening, reading, writing. I use various forms to help a child build comprehension and vocabulary. Uh, for instance, 
You can have a child sit in a chair of honor called an author's chair and read aloud what they and share what they wrote. You can have readers theater, um, which is very much favored by uh, people like Tim Rosinski, um, where children uh, will perform their reading out loud for the um, in very dramatic ways, oftentimes for the class. Um, read together. Reciprocal teaching is an approach in which First, you teach the child, and then now, secondly, the child um, teaches each other, and eventually you turn the class over to the child, and the child teaches to the class. Comprehension, uh, again, is the final goal of reading, and it's very contextual. You want to teach comprehension strategies very strategically, including summarization, the use of graphic organizers, self-questioning, making predictions. Discussions, um, guide, especially guided dis discussions, can be very useful uh, for students. You want to provide lots of different activities with very meaningful feedback to the students. What I mean by gradual release of responsibility is that for a while, when a child is first learning a skill, um, whether it's a reading skill or other skills, uh, I guess such as math skills, or if we weren't talking about reading, at first you're providing lots of guidance uh, to the child. But the ultimate goal, of course, is independence, uh, and eventually you release the child toward uh, taking on these skills independently. But there's always going to be a new, more difficult skill to work on. Next, let's deal with what I mean by explicit and systematic instruction, and not just what I would mean, but what does Desi mean by it, <laughs> more importantly, when it comes to getting involved. So when we talk about explicit instruction, we're talking about direct modeling of new skills that you want your students to be using, provide adequate guidance for the students, uh, to, uh, and especially if they've given you an incorrect uh, reading strategy or an incorrect writing response, you guide students toward with corrective feedback toward eventually being able to understand how to give the correct response and practice, practice, practice in appropriate ways. Um, explicit instruction involves giving clear directions to the students, making sure that students have very clear expectations, clear goals, they understand the learning objectives, you monitor their progress, and um, you make sure the students themselves knows what it means to succeed and how to monitor whether they're succeeding or not. That way you want your students to take ownership of their own success. So. Systematic instruction, like I said, systematic involves very direct um, instruction of these skills. Systematic instruction, it means having a very clear scope and sequence. So systematic instruction means being very consistent in your instructional routines uh, with a very clear uh, scope of what you want students to learn, a very clear sequence of how you're teaching these things. Um, you plan your instructional time very carefully and you provide opportunities for review and practice with your students. You want to be very sequential, um, and Desi wants you to be very sequential. So skills are taught in order from easier to harder and from prerequisite on up to um, more difficult skills. And that means you yourself as a teacher need to understand here are the skills the students need first in order to understand more difficult skills. For instance, in the early grades, students need to understand phonemic awareness sound parts in order to understand phonics, the understanding of letter sound correspondence. Um, and likewise, if a student is struggling with letter sound correspondence, they're going to likely struggle in phonics. And so if a child is struggling in phonics, um, focus on phonics. And then when a child makes adequate gains in fluency, now you can spend more time in fluency. 
So uh, too often times, like I said, uh, English language learners can be misdiagnosed. You want to make sure that you are teaching in ways that are appropriate. Ideally, especially as a beginning first year teacher, if you've got more expert um, English language learner teachers at your school, including specialists, um, work with work with guidance work with mentors um, you want to teach the student content and assess for understanding in a very explicit way um, your accommodations for english language learners should be based upon language not based upon the assumption that you're dealing with for instance decoding deficits or uh, comp or comprehension language comprehension deficits um, again that should be based upon the student's uh, diagnosis uh, use a team to help you. So discussions are very useful for your middle school students. That includes reading aloud, storybook reading, sharing of dialogue, um, having opportunities to get excited about what they're reading, using vocabulary in action. Uh, you want to have multiple opportunities with various types of texts, including high quality, even challenging texts. Uh, oftentimes when you're working with students, you, if they're working with, with a text that is a little bit challenging for them, that's where you as a teacher can guide them toward mastery and understanding of that more challenging text. And a challenging text can provide a, a student with practice of using their reading strategies. Because after all, if you're always reading a text that is at your just right level, at your easy level, then you're not going to have any reason to use your more complex comprehension strategies. You want to build content and background knowledge um, as students uh, practice their skill in reading. This teach students the strategic, the thinking processes that are involved in both reading and writing. Understand not just the goal of reading not don't don't always focus on the end goal but also focus on the process and it's okay to struggle for a little bit it's okay for a child to give you wrong answers now you want to correct those answers of course but it's okay for the child to struggle it's the process it's the journey that you're after um, like I said, use the visual language arts, visual viewing, writing, reading, speaking, listening. Use them interactively in your teaching in very creative ways. That's also going to help students avoid boredom, right? Uh, because obviously, obviously, if imagine a middle school student listening to this now hour long lesson by me, not having time to read, write, whatever in the middle of it. A middle school student trying to listen to me on this video would get bored. Uh, you wouldn't want to do that with your middle school students. Uh, you want to break up your instruction with various activities that can involve creating a visual representation or viewing a visual representation or opportunities to write, opportunities to read, opportunities to share a conversation, break up the class a little bit um, for not only um, the purposeful use of language um, in various ways, but also simply to avoid boredom. A bored student is more likely to be a misbehaving student. Um, Practice the various strategies with students very purposefully. Use think aloud strategies and use these steps that I'm talking about. Help students make predictions, help students summarize, uh, and again, you want to guide students to understand how you yourself do these things. It's always extremely important to build on background knowledge. Um, building on background knowledge is absolutely essential uh, for skilled reading and skilled writing. And therefore, for you as a teacher, it's very important for you to determine what is the child's background knowledge and how can you strategically help that child tap into background knowledge in order to build on it, in order to make connections between what they already know and what they're learning, so that what they're learning makes contextual sense and interest to them, and it is useful and meaningful to them based upon what they already know. Scaffolding is another, it's kind of a fancy term for a support system 
think of, you know, people who um, climb a mountain and they've got supports around their waist uh, to make sure they don't fall, for example. Um, now, extremely skilled mountain climbers might, might not need these helps, um, like there are these grips on the hands and tools that they use um, and, the, and the rope um, uh, tied to, uh, tied to, uh, tied around to make sure that they don't fall and so forth. Um, a, um, a skilled climber doesn't necessarily need these things. Likewise, skilled readers, skilled writers can eventually have the scaffolding, the think alouds, the cues, tips, the guided questions. Eventually, they might not need these things, but as a child is learning, um, this types of scaffolding can be very important the same way that for novice mountain climbers, um, having scaffolds and tools can really help a novice mountain climber. Um, scaffolding is all about helping novices accomplish complex tasks. Um, you can use um, uh, when I talk about physical scaffolds that includes, for instance, visual reminders to the students or the use of calculators and all that if you're talking about math um, and mental uh, cues can be mental scaffolding can be things like giving students tips giving students um, a little verbal assistance at just the right time just the right moment uh, but again you don't want to build learned helplessness you also as a teacher need to know when it's time to back off and your instructions should always be, of course, data-driven, based upon assessment and appropriate assessment, ideally working with a team of more expert teachers to help you. And you want to be very collaborative. Um, you want to plan your instruction. Uh, you want to put your instruction in action. Check to see whether the instruction is working or not, meeting learning goals or not. And make revisions appropriately and act upon those revisions and then go back and plan again in this cyclical process. And hopefully this was of use to you. I know it ran a little bit long, but I'm anticipating when I make these longer videos, you can always pause and come back. Um, but um, hopefully this was useful for you. The main thing that I want you to come away with is Outstanding instruction is not something that you do in a knee-jerk way, and it's not something that is easy. And you're likely, most first-year teachers struggle to do the types of things I'm talking about. That's okay. I wasn't as skilled as a first-year teacher as I, as I am now. If I were to take step into a middle school classroom and a high school classroom, um, I wasn't as skilled in my first year as I as I became as a as a first year high school teacher as I became by the time I became a veteran high school teacher. Um, I made tremendous mistakes when I was a first year teacher. You can expect to make mistakes too. You're not going to be perfect. That's okay. But just as students need practice, you're going to need practice too. Um, and just as students need scaffolding and support, you're going to need scaffolding and support too. Take care.